<laughs> that was way better. Oh. <laughs> All right. One more That's time. the only time I talk. <laughs> hey. Fayetteville, Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't do a second show. <laughs> we almost looked professional the first time with only one false start. <laughs> Just prove that you can play it first. <laughs> oh. from the nether regions of the Bible Belt. This is your Northwest Arkansas Free Thought TV. Hey guys, welcome to Free Thought Northwest Arkansas. I'm your host, Donald Morton, and today's show is going to be on creationism. I have brought with me a panel of skeptics and professors and scientists. On my right, we have Dr. Mike Plav Plavkin, a uh, professor of paleoanthropology from the University of Arkansas. Also from the Fayetteville Freethinkers, we have Doug Kruger, who is also a professor at NWAC of um, philosophy and world religions, right? Yes, that's right. Sweet. And then we have Alan Ashley, um, skeptic, atheist, computer programmer. So um, on to announcements. We've got the, now you're from the Fayetteville Freethinkers and they meet monthly and give presentations, is that correct? That's right. We meet at the Fayetteville Public Library every month on the last Saturday of the month at 2 o'clock and our meetings typically last about uh, two and a half hours and we have presentations on all kinds of interesting subjects, everything from uh, the Bible to Bigfoot to uh, UFOs, uh, you know, the, the, some things that are topical, some things that are perennial. Last time you had cargo cults, that was pretty cool. Yes, we had cargo cults, uh, yeah, yeah. We've, we've got all kinds of good stuff. We had something on Thomas Paine, a famous free thinker. Yeah. Also, we've got a, a free thought group in Rogers. The, um, the, they, meet, they meet at the Iron Horse Coffee Company Fridays at six o'clock. And it's just a, a social environment where you can hang out and talk in a religion-free environment. And if you'd like to email the show, we have an email address at the show at freethoughtnwa.com. That's all. You can also see our website up there, freethoughtnwa.com, where you can view our past shows. Just tell us what you think. If you have questions or think that we're wrong, we'd love to hear it. And we also have a voicemail number, 479-430-2112. If you would like to tell us anything, just call that and leave a message, and we'll play on the show for you. So the subject of today is creationism. Um, last show, we specifically covered human evolution. This is going to kind of be a shorter show because we're running out of time for the, the studio is going to close on us. So what I wanted to do on, there's a great website that has evidence for evolution called talkorigins.org. And on the site, they have a huge index of creationist claims where basically they have a, something that creationists say and a source for it, and it's got all the refutations for it, and it's enormous. We can't go through all of it, but I went through and picked out some things that I thought were funny. So what I want to do is, <laughs> is uh, say what the creationists say, and then you guys can give your reactions to it. And I won't tell you what the response is on the origin site, and you can kind of guess what it says. We can see how right we are. Yeah, kind of like the <laughs> Billy Graham thing, but right. yeah. So the first one, evolution is the foundation of an immoral worldview. This is, um, it, it's kind of connected to the, uh, what was that movie that with, with Ben Stein in it? Expelled. Expelled, Expelled. yeah, <laughs> where they, they showed Hitler and how he was doing experiments on people and how that was all based on evolution. So and on a, every Nazi's belt, God with us is you know, printed. Why would they do that if they're atheists? <laughs> they wouldn't. Well, in yeah. fact, uh, also to be an SS officer, you had to be a Christian. It was stipulated in the rules. Really? Yeah. So how is evolution not the foundation of an immoral worldview? Why is that wrong? Well, it's wrong because, uh, first of all, evolution isn't an ethical theory, and, it, and uh, most ethical theories are not based on uh, views about biology. 
So it really has nothing to do with, uh, with whether one is moral or immoral. Uh, evolution is about biology. Ethics is about behavior, and one can behave one way or another regardless of what one's biology is, uh, at least to some extent. Uh, and so those who say that uh, people are using evolution to try to support an immoral worldview, or sometimes you'll hear uh, people say, well, if you tell the students you know, in biology class, if you tell them that they're monkeys, they're going to behave like monkeys. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard that. <laughs> one, thing, one thing I thought I was that funny that it said in here nonsense. was that evolution is descriptive. It just describes what's happening in the world. So if you brought this argument to its logical conclusion, if you saw a child with a broken arm, you'd have to demand that their arm stay broken because that's how it is. Evolution is, well, science tells us what is, but it also does tell us why things happen. In terms of human behavior, uh, there's a lot of study out there, and humans do actually behave like apes. It is absolutely true. and. Uh, it's important because it explains why people do what they do. Um, as I have told right. my daughter many times in the battle between ideology and biology, biology will usually win. And it's through knowing and understanding why we do what we do that we can actually have a better and uh, more effective response to apply our ethics to our own behavior. Right, our social dynamics were evolved as well. And we can Absolutely. tell some of that through the behavior of, Absolutely. of some of the great apes. And we study ourselves and we study other animals and we find out that we do behave in these consistent ways. And it allows us, because our, our ethics do transcend that, it's one of the great things about being a person is that you know our ethics are something that's separate from that and allows us to, to work with it and, and get more effective ways to be more ethical and moral in our society. And there's also a thought that, that the evolutionary view or evolution leads to people wanting to get rid of the weak. Uh, and, 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 and in actuality, it is more beneficial for, for humans to have a diverse population. Humans are inherently altruistic. And we are altruistic primates. And to say that we're, you know, this justifies, well, you can use anything to justify anything. And religion has been used just as much as evolution for the most heinous and horrific of crimes. Of course, we all know those are independent. Uh, you can twist the Bible any way you want to support right. anything you want. And you can twist evolution and science to do the same thing. Claim yeah. number two, students need to be taught all sides of a controversial issue. Evolution should not be taught without teaching the controversy that surrounds it. I am more than happy to teach creation science in my classroom, but they are not going to like what they hear because <laughs> I will teach the truth. Well, is, I have not heard, is there actually any positive evidence on it, on the intelligent design or creationism? No. It's all attacks on, on what they think perceive There's a, as the faults evidence in is, evolution. The evidence is God did it. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that came out in that 2005 Dover decision is uh, the judge uh, you know, very uh, carefully and methodically went through the evidence presented by the, uh, by the creationists or the intelligent design proponents. And one of the things the judge concluded is that intelligent design is really just another form of creationism. It's not anything different. They were it's, trying to purport that they were, you know, not creationists. And it's we're God not saying it's God. We don't know. Yeah. Right. In fact, that's one thing that fellow Luskin uh, kept mm -hmm. emphasizing when he spoke here at the U of A. Uh, Which a, is a funny because Expelled weeks ago. makes no. I mean, he showed the movie Expelled beforehand, and it makes no attempt to hide that they're throwing God into that. Who's the designer? Right. Hole. Exactly. But and, and originally when that Expelled came out. Uh, Luskin and his organization weren't exactly happy with the God being thrown out there because it kind of put them back into the creationist column the, the, where they tried to be science. The Discovery Institute actually has a document that has been nicknamed the Wedge Document because mm -hmm. it, they called it the Wedge Document in which they outlined very explicitly and very clearly that their goal in promoting intelligent design is to put God back into uh, science and to replace a material, in their words, a materialistic humanistic view of science, philosophy, culture across the board with a theistic view. And they were very, very explicit about it. And initially, they denied the existence of the document. It was legally proved that, in fact, it was theirs. Then they said, well, so what? And <laughs> <laughs> Another thing on teaching creationism in schools is which creation myth um, are we going to teach? I mean, you're, you're a professor of world religions. Aren't there lots of creation myths? Oh, there's tons of them. Uh, there's one, well, even in Hinduism, there's uh, multiple creation myths. One that the uh, gods got together and made the universe out of wood and, you know, hammered Seriously. it together and so forth. Yeah, that's one. Uh, so there, there's a whole bunch that one can we choose from. We have to from. teach those too. Sure, if you want to teach something that's not substantiated by science and, and it's, it's not a like product of, of religion thousands of years ago, sure, you got a bunch of them. And those aren't 
religions that like one person made up. There's cultures that have these whole religions that are very different. Oh, absolutely, sure. Mm -hmm. We yeah. have world religion classes for that stuff. Yeah, not science class. And in fact, even in the uh, in Genesis, you can find uh, more than one version of how human beings were made. Right. Were men and women created together, or was one after the other created from the rib, as opposed to, you know, at the same time and so forth. Here's one that I know that Alan can do just as good of a job refuting as any of the oh, others. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it is inconceivable that fill-in-the-blank could have originated naturally. Therefore, it must have been created. We had a whole show on this. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's the argument from ignorance right there. <laughs> right, because I can't think of it. Right. God did it. Well, I mean, there, it started out, if you think about it, we couldn't explain a lot of things. We couldn't explain lightning, and, and they attributed to, to gods being angry, you know, storm, an old mythological... Uh, uh, myths and as we go on and we discover more about our world we find out that none of that stuff is magical or coming from nowhere we have explanations for it everything that we've we've proven none of it has been you know mystical or, or magical this is one of the reasons intelligent design is viewed as such a dangerous proposition is because effectively it shuts down the scientific inquisition um, you know, you have to be very careful and say that if you want to believe that God did it or was somehow involved with it, then you can honestly go ahead and believe that. It's perfectly fine to accept that. But to say that science has anything to do with it is is uh, completely out of the realm of science. But it's they're wearing just lab not. coats and goggles. But, well, <laughs> yeah, it is. But, but effectively what they do is they shut down scientific inquiry by saying that I don't understand it, therefore God must have done it. My proof of God is my inability to comprehend. You stop Therefore, and then you stop asking questions, and exactly. that will shut down science. Science is is an inquisitive process where you always ask questions and try to test hypotheses. Right. Well, that's one of the advantages of science, and, and also with with regard to ethics, in that if ethics is, is something that, uh, for example, we can make accessible, uh, like we can say, well, let's agree that you know maybe whatever the majority says is going to be the law, will be the law, or whatever, as opposed to. So secretly, some being spoke to me and said, "We should do X." Right. Well, uh, one is accessible to uh, you know sort of a public examination. We can decide whether or not people really want to do that. And it can change. Yeah, and it can change. And the other one is you know well, the person's either telling the truth or not, and there's no way we can really examine it. Same thing here. It's either a uh, process in science that one can examine and critique and so forth, or it was something magical. And once you put it in the realm of the magical, well. We don't have any evidence for that. There's no way we can get our hands on it. There's no way we can reproduce it, critique it, you know. You know another side aspect of that is that uh, when you look at the arguments for intelligent design, um, specifically the molecular arguments that they use, um, scientists have actually looked at those structures that uh, Behe and uh, friends have claimed are irreducibly bacterial complex. Flagellum. The bacterial flagellum. and claim that because they're irreducibly complex, they could not have evolved. And the assumption that Behe uses is that um, something that is irreproducibly complex could not have had a secondary function, that it only had to have one and one unique function and could never have had any other function at the time. And these things have been proven to be flat out wrong, I mean proven over and over and over again. And we in fact understand how irreducibly complex systems evolve. So we have a mechanism for it, it is understood. And the more we study it, the more we understand about other systems. What they do then is simply deny they go into a period of denial or a, a state of denial and simply say, well, that's just not true. And then so, the next thing they can latch on to. <coughs> next question. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is <laughs> kind of, it shuts this, down science. This is kind of fun because I get to play creationist for the show. Oh, boy. <laughs> Mr. Plotkin, isn't it true that many scientists reject evolution and support creationism? It's absolutely not true. Well, it's, it's, it's funny because um, there are some scientists out there, of course, who are creationists. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a very, very tiny percentage. There I is, have the percentages. Yeah, it's, go for it. According to a 1991 Gallup poll, <laughs> only about 5% of scientists are creationists. However, that number includes scientists working in fields not even related to life origins, like That's computer right. scientists. I don't think computer scientists are actually scientists, but okay. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> engineers. Is this an argument between you two? No. <laughs> taking, taking into account only those people who work in relevant fields of earth and life sciences, aka those who would be in the know, there are about 480,000 scientists. Only 700 believe in creation science. That means that less than zero 0.15% of relevant scientists believe in creationism. Yeah, the 700 had signed that document, I assume is what you're talking about, because at least that's a 699 because uh, one of them pulled back when he found out what it was he was <laughs> asked. That's the, uh, that's the... Uh, Did they uh, trick him? Uh, there was a document that you... Oh, what what like was the name of the document? 
Yeah, actually, he didn't understand it. Um, and when he found out what they were using it for, he uh, publicly yeah. said, this is wrong, and that's not mm -hmm. what I think. What is that document called? Uh, the, oh, um, gosh, I can't remember what it uh, was. Scientist, a scientist that who doubt evolution document. They, anyway, yeah. the creationists uh, uh, claim that there are 700 signatories to this document doubting evolution. And the National Science <laughs> Center for Science Education has a document, I believe they've crossed a thousand now, of scientists who support evolution who are named Steve. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> since, since there's only, I believe it's 1% of the population is named Steve, right. Right, that tells <laughs> you at least 100,000 people who well, support it. you so. a scientist, right? Such a broad term. When are you a scientist? When are you not? Well, are, if you are actually you look at the credentials of all 700 people, you'll find that virtually no one on that list actually is credentialed. Right, so mm -hmm. they talked about it where you get mechanical engineers consider yeah. themselves scientists. That's strange, strange. It's, I think well, there were also yeah. people that work behind the counter at pharmacies, you know, things like that, were uh, scientists. Yeah, the reality is that um, evolution is accepted by the scientific community, and it's, and it's accepted because it works. Except for 0.15%. Yeah, well, you can always find, I mean, yeah. even in my own discipline, yeah. there's a couple of people yeah. that so much for evolution, a theory things? in crisis. Right? It's not <laughs> a theory in crisis. <laughs> One of the evolution, you have to remember evolution is widely viewed as being more strongly supported than gravity. Right. We understand how evolution works. We do not ha understand how gravity works. But they're both theories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that, the, yeah. <laughs> just a theory. A theory doesn't necessarily mean just a guess or just a hypothesis. In science, it, it means a system of explanations for how something works. That's correct. So yes. you can refer to the theory of gravity, the helio, the theory of heliocentric. Centric, nah, the heliocentric sun, theory. Yeah, the yes, sun is at the right. center of the galaxy. Um, or at least the solar system. Solar system. <laughs> yeah. but well, that's the theory of gravity, the theory of quantum mechanics, right. which makes nuclear bombs go boom, and the theory of aerodynamics that makes planes fly. So they latch onto that word theory. And they, they latch onto their it, own and they use the colloquial term of the butler did it. Yeah. And you, get, um, you guys should pick a different word. <laughs> You lost it, I think. Uh, yeah, I think. It's, if we picked a different word, they just use that in the and, same and way. And Dawkins, the greatest show on earth, he, he, he decides to use a uh, theorem to kind of put it more in line with uh, mathematical theorems. Yeah. Evolution, like geometry. evolution is, um, yeah. you, you know, it, uh, evolution is accepted because it's powerful. It explains things that cannot be otherwise explained. It's, it's just a phenomenal, phenomenal theory. It's not, and people corroborate it every day. There are tens of thousands of papers that get published of people testing hypotheses about evolution. Every time we in the, you know, work in the fossil record, we effectively test it. You know, if we found bunny rabbits in the Permian, then we would refute it. Okay. And boy, we'd have a heck of a paper there. In that same vein, but the next claim is evolution has not been and cannot be proved. We can't even see evolution beyond trivially small changes, much less tested experimentally. Speciation has been demonstrated in the wild. Yeah, there's Very, a whole page yeah. here of, of <laughs> evidence of, yeah. of evolution and specific observations. We have a magnificent fossil record, actually, in some places. My favorite is in the Big Horn Basin, where we have almost nine or ten million years of continuous sequences and uh, specimens of animals uh, on the order of tens of thousands. And, uh, where the, you can the, see changes. Where you can document place. changes, radical changes, you know, loss of teeth, changes of teeth, transitions. Um, it gets to the point in the, uh, in the Bighorn Basin and the Wasatchian sequences where um, people have difficulty identifying species, not because the changes aren't radical, but because the, the gradual transitions, you don't know where to draw the line. You, you can show them transforming into one thing and the other, but... but uh, when does yeah, one thing begin? When does one thing a, actually mm -hmm. begin and not, you know, it's yeah. like black changing into white, you know? At some point, you gotta draw a line and say, well, you know, this thing is turning. It, it, it's, it's one continuous sequence on the grade, but does that mean that black is actually white? Right. Well, no. Yeah. Uh, but if, if you only have black and white, you can easily call them black and white. But if you have a grayscale in between, where do you draw the and line? I think that's where some creationists misunderstand. Yes. They, they think, yeah. I get a, you get a lot of these crazy guys who talk about, why, why don't we see uh, Crocoduck, you know, uh, Ray Comfort and, and mm -hmm. uh, Kirk Cameron, and they expect that one day... <laughs> Banana boy. Yeah, <laughs> one day a crocodile half half. had a... Yes. Half duck child, uh, or you know, it, yeah. it, it was it's ridiculous. And and they have the no transitional fossils because you have a, a fossil at point A and you have a fossil at point B, and then you find one in between. Well, now you've got two more gaps, That's and there's not a really a here's where this one begins, here's where that the one ends. The more evidence you have, the less you if have. If you looked at it, it'd That's be right. a gradient, just like you said, going from black to white. If you saw a gradient, 
you you couldn't tell where black ended when where white ended. You know? Well, we see that in human evolution too. Right. We have a lot of controversy over naming species uh, in some areas, and and the controversies have changed from the previous years gloriously so in that we have so much evidence for it that it becomes difficult as to exactly where you're going to draw the and, line. And in a lot of ways, the actual naming of species kind of contributes to that. Well, this grouping that we well, the, pro yeah, the, the problem is, is the problem there is that species is actually a creationist concept right. when it was originally formulated. The Platonic concept of something that's static and unchanging, mm -hmm. and in biology, it actually is something that is dynamic and changing. Right. And even in living biological populations, you have a tremendous difficulty applying this concept of a static, unchanging thing mm -hmm. to living populations. And so uh, there's 26, 29 species concepts out there to try to accommodate all the variation and gradistic change that you see from one thing to the other. Well, one of the uh, analogies I give my students is uh, I say, well, if you think, especially with the micro-macro type of oh. distinction between evolution, I say, if you think that uh, microevolution can't give you macroevolution, that would be like saying, well, uh, sure, you could take a number of small steps and get across Fayetteville, but you could never walk from Fayetteville to Chicago, for example. Yeah. And of course, that's obviously, obviously absurd. But then further than that, for those who that's think there must be a, a, a fossil of uh, one animal versus another, I would say that's like saying if I did walk from Fayetteville to Chicago, then at some point I must have had one foot in Fayetteville and one foot in Chicago. All right. Right, which is absurd. <laughs> so. yeah. Yeah. Well, that's an you excellent were, analogy. Yeah. You were um, never in between. So we've got like yeah. 20, 25 minutes. I have a ton I'll of things here. But I want to make sure we cover this letter to the editor that I emailed you before. Uh, this was from January 25th by Ronnie Flowers, and it was in response to a article written by Art Hobson, who I believe is a prof professor at the university as well, and he essentially wrote a, an article um, on fundamentalism versus biological reality, and he kind of tried to argue for evolution. That's way too long, I'm not gonna read that, but I do wanna read the response to it. Um, and it's kind of long, but I think, I'm, I'm probably gonna read like a couple sentences and you guys are gonna get mad and have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> so feel free to interrupt me and we'll get <laughs> interrupt me and then we'll get through it eventually. All right. Okay. Art Hobson asked the question on January 17th, why then deny the clear and inspiring evidence of evolution as revealed through human intelligence? It is very easy to deny the form of evolution about which he talked because it is not based on science. Really? <laughs> His idea of evolution is that all life originated from subatomic particles using macroevolution. I'm not sure that's an accurate explanation of evolution. Um, this is faith and not science. Science is based on what can be observed and tested. That's, I think, clearly showing that he has no idea how evolution works. That's a common argument of, of science is just another religion. It's just another, you have to have faith in order to believe in the science. The argument is that you have observational science, they call it, and science of the past, and that if you didn't see it happen, you can't prove that it happened, um, which people will be quick to point out that the entire criminal justice system would collapse if that was true. <laughs> because, <laughs> Yeah. You didn't see it. So let yeah, them all right. go. Yeah. So and that Richard same Dawkins' person. new book on evolution, he has a whole thing on the power of direct inference versus direct observation mm -hmm. and how lay people think that direct mm -hmm. observation is better, but in fact, inference is more powerful. Yeah. There's a really good video. I don't know. Some, some people may have seen it of the, the kids passing around the basketball and you're asked to to yes, watch the ba count the those. number of That's throws right. the, the you know passes yeah. the basketball makes. That's right. And people are focusing real hard on that mm -hmm. and they get the number toward the end. and. And it's not really about the number. They're told afterwards, after watching this video, did anyone see the man in a gorilla suit walk right through the middle? Yeah. And there's a very large percentage of people who do not do see, not see this because yes. they're so focused in. It just kind of shows how it's uh, pretty funny. How how visual evidence isn't all it's cracked up to be. I saw that, and I did not see the I guy in the gorilla suit. <laughs> 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 okay, next, next paragraph. Macroevolution has never been observed. As for Artipithecus, the bones is the science, but the drawings show the faith of the artist. Hobson said it correctly when he said, what a story emerged. So I think essentially what he's arguing is that when you see the sculptures of ancient hominids or the pictures of them, there's the artist interpretation, but actually all we have are bones and that means nothing. I guess I take that from what he said. I'm a little confused by that exactly, but um He's correct. Uh, we have the bones, and the bones are very clear in saying right. that this is a really cool animal. Uh, the artist rendition that was put in science is it's neat, but nobody in science ever claims that. Well, that's um, kind we of we saw it, and we looked at it, and we were kind of jealous that they got the science artists, uh, staff artists, to draw the picture for them. And the rest of us schmucks have to do it ourselves. Right. <laughs> uh, nice picture, uh, kind of creepy looking. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> 
even at the drawings. One can look at all the creationist interpretations at www.answersingenesis.org. Creationists have faith that God created everything in six days. A worldwide flood destroyed all life on earth except for one family and two of every kind of animal. I read a thing where they decided to start using kind instead of species. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. they call it barominology. Um, if you also go to Answers in Genesis, you'll find a statement of faith by the scientists that all scientists working for Answers in Genesis have to sign. And that statement says, to paraphrase it, that no evidence, regardless of the evidence, regardless of its implications, regardless of the strength of the evidence for any evolution that contradicts the Bible can possibly be true. That's disturbing. Okay. Yes, ergo, they believe what they believe it's regardless of any... It's a different philosophy on gaining knowledge. It's, a, it's not even a philosophy. It's, it's, it's not even a philosophy. It's, it's, it is an explicit statement. You can go to Answers in Genesis and you will find this statement. You have to dig for it. It's in their statement of faith for their, for their staff. But anybody who works for them and writes for them has to sign this statement, effectively saying that they will deny all evidence as wrong, de facto, Right. Regard, they cannot do science effectively. They have to deny all evidence if it disagrees with their interpretation of the Bible. And then the first ones to claim that scientists are the ones ignoring evidence. So that's, I think, the most telling thing of the answers in Genesis. So. And that all life recreated itself in the last 6,000 years or so since the flood through observed and tested fact of natural selection. However, natural selection is not the same as macroevolution. Saying that natural selection has creative power is a faith-based statement because natural selection has been observed and tested to only change a species within its own kind and not change into another animal. Well, of course, that depends on what, since they're not using the term species as opposed to, or sometimes they use kinds, right? What's going to be a, separ a different kind? What's going to be a different species? Uh, they're not clear about that, and I can guarantee you the author of that thing isn't clear about that in his own mind. You also have to understand that evolution is not just natural selection. The Darwin came up with a mechanism for evolution, and it was only one of the accepted mechanisms now of evolution. Evolutionists and say that the Grand Canyon was created with a little <coughs> water over a long period of time, <laughs> but creationists say that, uh, I guess you've heard this a lot, but oh. creationists say that it was created with lots of water over a short period of time. I'm I'd guessing like that would be I want to see that done. 90%, this is a good one. 90% <laughs> of all dating methods give far younger dates than the amount that evolutionists need for life to come from subatomic particles. Let's go to the Grand Canyon and ask them, first of all, in the middle of the Grand Canyon deposits in that column, we have strata with footprints in it. Okay, where would they come from? Terrestrial animal footprints. So. Mm -hmm. People were walking during the flood oh, on the let's, bottom. You know, Judith River formation. <laughs> it's a great one. You know, take another formation. Uh, the Judith River, for, uh, yeah, it's dinosaur formation where you find dinosaur nests. And this is supposedly a flood deposit from Noah's flood. It's got dinosaur nests interspersed in between it. So, <laughs> you know, presumably the flood dried up. The surviving dinosaurs nested. Then the flood came back a couple days later, killed everything. Then it receded, and the dinosaurs came back and nested again and again and again, leaving <laughs> footprints and nests. And it, it's just stunning. Okay. Well, at least this person isn't using the old uh, creationist absurdity that, uh, well, the river is at the bottom. How could it have started carving at the top? The water would have had to float up to the top. And I've never heard that one. That's oh, yeah, <laughs> I've heard that a number of times. I've yeah. He's not done yet. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to skip a little bit. Oh, okay, it maybe up. it is there. Okay. Why can't the science be taught and let the students come up with their own interpretations of the science instead of having the atheistic interpretation forced on them? This is a guy from Bentonville. Scientists readily admit that evolution does not have all the answers for how life originated and how it progressed. However, they say that the answers will be discovered based on faith. Biology, archaeology, paleontology, and other sciences should be taught in the churches so that when students get told in biology class that all the science leads to believing that the story of Adam and Eve and Noah and the Flood are just make-believe and that all life originated from... Okay, learn punctuation, please. Jeez. <laughs> and all life originated from subatomic particles, then they can ask for the science and not an interpretation. Page 436 in the BHS Biology textbook has the ancestry of mammals with dashed lines where macroevolution is supposed to happen. My advice to everyone is to learn the true science and decide for yourself what interpretation fits the science better. We should all decide for ourselves. Um, I, I'm going to choose tomorrow to just, the gravity's not real, <laughs> and I'm just going to float off uh, into space. Yeah, you I need mean, to my investigate own for yourself. Of it, right? <laughs> Don't just take people's no. word for it. <laughs> it yeah. It's, uh, boy, where do you begin answering this? Um, 
Uh, and that's the thing is when like you this. get one of these, it takes three times as long to, to, to refute it because they, they don't take the, any time to actually research what they say. And <laughs> they don't know you, what they get an know. argument. It's you yeah, know like one line. You have to you have spend to. two paragraphs just to refute it. I think for we're talking about something like that, you have to step back and say first of all that um, evolutionary biology does not um, mandate atheism. This is yeah. to begin. Uh, they like to whip on Richard Dawkins a lot. Uh, Richard Dawkins does not speak for me, and he doesn't speak for many of my colleagues. Richard Dawkins wrote his his actual reputation in science was based on a book called The Selfish Gene which was a magnificent book, and I use it to uh, teach uh, about altruism and genetics and natural selection and evolution. Um, his proselytization for atheism, which is his business, is what he likes to do. Um, but he is not the representative of the scientific community. And most scientists um, will say that evolution speaks to evolution. It talks about how life originated, and it speaks to how life diversity originated, more specifically, and uh, how what we see around us in life came to be. Um, religious beliefs can be accommodated around that, and many people who accept evolution, many scientists who accept evolution, uh, are also religious. And they admittedly will have to tailor their the theology somewhat, as mainstream churches do, Catholic Church, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Episcopal churches, accept theologically that evolution did occur, and that it is a fact, and their theology accommodates that observation, as St. Augustine himself is noted by many people that have said that if you try to teach things that are flagrantly false to the casual observer's eye, then you, uh, uh, then people are going to mock you. Uh, this whole idea that evolution mandates uh, atheism is simply wrong. Now, if you want to be an atheist and use evolution, easy. Well, in but fact, with regard to uh, theology, it's a separate question. Uh, the majority of theologians working today would not affirm that the story of Adam and Eve is literally true, and those were our ancestors. That uh, mm -hmm. only about a third, uh, maybe about thirty percent, at least in the U.S., of Christians take the Bible to be that sort of inerrant, uh, literal word of God. Mm -hmm. So he's even wrong about the theology. Yeah. A true science must make predictions. Evolution only describes what happened in the past, so it's not predictive. <laughs> Makes absolute predictions. It says Darwin himself actually in the book uh, made a number of predictions which you can list out, and all of them have been corroborated again and again and again. Uh, evolution, the easiest thing about evolution for the paleontological world, which is where I work, is uh, Haldane's original statement that um, if you want to disprove evolution, find bunny rabbits in the per Permian. Uh, fossil record, uh, we find these things by the ton, and you can find them here in Fayetteville. And again and again and again, it corroborates evolution. Well, Every how time. about the coelacan? I mean, when this is the the fish that had had basically limbs, they yes. they predicted where it was going to be. Mm -hmm. They went to northern Canada and mm -hmm. they said, "This is the specific uh, tectolic. Strata. Yeah, tectolic. Yes, yeah. Tectolic. Yes. Yeah, this is where we expect yeah. it to be. They went there yes. and dug there based on the predictions in evolution, right. and they found it. That's right. And we've done the same thing in human evolution. And when the molecular genetics came out and said that humans and chimps shared a common ancestor around six to seven million years ago, paleontologists actually resisted the idea initially. They were they rejected it. In fact very vocally and uh, the prediction was made that in the fossil record you would find animals that are very difficult to tell apart and that is indeed what we are finding that animals are very difficult to tell as we talk about the arguments over what a species is and isn't that would yes. be predicted by evolution yeah, because it's, of um, it, is, uh, it has been spectacularly successful and, and, the, and of course the predictions made by the creationists that have uh, been corroborated by science are nil right? uh, and uh, qua creationism right, right. Grayson, as it pretends to try to be. There's science. also an, yes. an example yeah. in uh, Dawkins' greatest show on Earth uh, about uh, they found a uh, flower that um, it had a very long uh, shape to it, and they they predicted that there must be some some creature that could get down into that into the flower in order to pollinate it. They yes. hadn't found it yet, mm -hmm. and then after looking and looking, they did. They found a moth with a with a tongue. I guess for uh, I don't know if you'd still call it a tongue, but mm -hmm. a tongue that was extremely long and purposely for pollinating those specific those specific flowers and they had had evolved together and were uh, evolved uh, why don't what you would call it co symbiotic coevolution co yep okay last one because we're almost out of time this is what my favorite evolution says that you're descended from a monkey do you want to be descended from a monkey <laughs> and there's the co claim is uh, 
<laughs> if, if, if evolution says we came from monkeys, then why are there babies, still monkeys? Yeah, why are there still monkeys around? <laughs> if you were born of your parents, why are they still alive? Yeah. If, I, if my ancestors came from Mexico, why are there people still in Mexico? Uh, it's, it's, a it's just very, an absurd yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think the, the problem is, um, when we discussed at the last show, when you have the, uh, the pictorial um, mm -hmm. progression of ape to man, it shows them all in a line, but That's actually right. it's a tree. That's right. The um, chimpanzees and humans share a common ancestor. Right. And that common ancestor, chimpanzees have been evolving just like humans have been evolving. And this is pretty well understood in the scientific community. So uh, they're still there. Yeah. They had a common ancestor. Well, Not that we came from ancestor. chimpanzees. <laughs> uh, I think we only have a few minutes, so I don't know how much we want to get into. There's bacterial flagella, but there's like pages and pages yeah, on that. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit. Uh, complex organs and biological functions could not have evolved. That's kind of the same as the... It's irreducible complexity argument. And yeah, to make a very <laughs> long story very short, um, irreducible complexity is common and it's the norm. To give you an example, if I cut your leg off, you're not going to be able to walk. Okay, it's irreducibly complex. And I like to give to students an example to show how things like this evolve. If, we take, if you take your legs, you walk on two legs. You cut off your leg, you're going to need crutches. Now you walk with one leg and the crutches. The crutches and the legs work together. Cut off your other leg, you now have to walk with crutches. Therefore, you were designed to walk with crutches. That's the logic. <laughs> That's right. awesome. You see, right. because you've taken off the legs. Complexity evolves in systems. Systems naturally evolve highly complex, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, highly integrating complexity. And what happens to get an irreducibly complex system is all you are doing is taking something with multiple functions, and as they become codependent, two items, you reduce their multiple functions to a single function, in which case it then lends the appearance that they must have been designed to be exactly like that with nothing else. It's common. It's easy to demonstrate. You can do it with a computer, very simply. There are many, many examples out there, and, and the claim is, is absurd in the light of what we know. Well, one of the things that I sometimes uh, tell my students when we go over this uh, in relation to certain arguments, like the fine-tuning argument and so forth, uh, is that uh, here we have, uh, let's say, two competing theories. We have uh, creationism and we have evolution. Uh, evolution uh, you know, has a mountains and mountains of evidence in its favor and so forth, um, and yet there are certain gaps that you know, people can't explain and so forth, but uh, by and large it's you know, extremely well documented as a, um, as a theory, meaning that it uh, you know, is substantiated uh, by the evidence. Now, on the other hand, we have creationism. And what does it have in its favor? Well, its mechanism that it proposes is something for which we have no substantiation. Its mechanism is magic, okay? Um, so if we have two theories competing, and we have, on the one hand, something with uh, a great deal of evidence in its favor, even though it's not, you know, the creationist we want to say, 100% proven, there's still gaps, versus nothing but a gap we have nothing but a gap on the other side, then which of these should I decide in favor of? Well, it seems like it's no contest, right? Even though one of them isn't, uh, you know, as well fleshed out as we would wish, uh, you know, and, and certainly there's more and more evidence coming along, um, there's nothing on the other side. And it doesn't look like there's any more evidence coming on the horizon. It's either magic or it wasn't. We have no mechanism, no explanation. It doesn't advance our knowledge. Uh, it doesn't have any scope to explain other things as well, and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's really a no-brainer, right? Something with lots of evidence that's incomplete, something that's nothing but incomplete. Which of these should I choose? Well, I think we, that's, that's a good point to end it on. Is, is there any other points you guys wanted to bring up before we get out of here? We're not, this is going to be a shorter show because we're getting kicked out of the studio. <laughs> <laughs> and not because of what we said, though. No. Yeah. <laughs> Because he ate all the donuts. And oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> there was donuts. <laughs> Got those. Before well, me. thanks for coming, guys. Yeah. I think uh, your expertise has made for a very interesting yes. show, and I look forward to actually watching it. <laughs> thanks all for right. having us. Thanks.